uh, her oldest son committed suicide yesterday. And so I'm like, ah. not to be a downer, but it's an important topic to talk about depression and mental illness and all the different various elements. So we're good to start? Yeah, we're good to start. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone, to B-Sides Nashville. How's everybody doing today? Everybody's comatose from lunch? Oh, yeah. I'll, tr I'll try to keep you guys awake. Um, let's start off real quickly. Uh, obviously, I would think you're here because you have some interest in answer to this question. So I wanted to start with a quick survey. How many people think the answer to the question is yes? Just a show of hands. There's no right or wrong answer, just a curiosity. All the DOD employees raise their hands. How many people think the answer is no? OK. How many people are just kind of waiting for me to see what I have to say? And how many people think, let's just get going <laughs> to more important things? All right. Um, the reason this question came about, uh, I had a customer many, many years ago, probably almost 10 years ago. Um, I was doing PCI at the time. And uh, it's good that you can't see a lot of detail on that because it's the PCI standard. Uh, I had a, a retail customer uh, that we were having a discussion about encryption and the options for uh, protecting data, credit card data, at rest in storage. So I was going over all the details, all the options that PCI gives you, encryption being one of them, where they call it strong cryptography. And because I have a DOD background, I'm actually trained as a crypt cryptologist, cryptanalyst. Uh, I was probably going into more detail that they were interested in. Um, nobody's ever had that experience before, right? Where you geek out a little bit much, too much on the details. But we had this conversation about all the different options and at the end, they said, yeah, but we don't need DOD level security. We just sell women's underwear or whatever it was at the time. And it's funny, I've, you know, I've had variations of that comment come back to me from customers over the years. I spent 10 years doing PCI as a QSA. And there was a lot of, we sell shoes, we sell you know, the Home Depot breach. The CEO literally said, we sell hammers. I'm like, yes, that's what, that's what retailers say all the time. Why should anybody care about us? So that question actually, because this person said it to me eight or nine years ago, it's just stuck in my head for this many years. It always keeps coming back to me. And uh, I decided to, uh, based on recent events, we'll go into more detail in a few minutes, but I decided to have a talk about this and just talk about this question about DOD level security. So real briefly, my name is Jeff Mann. I am uh, a, uh, an official curmudgeon. I am a co-host in Security Weekly. I've had people come up to me and say, you look really familiar. I'm like, Security Weekly? That's it. So if, if I look familiar, maybe you've seen me online. Um, a little bit about me. Um, Obviously, I got my start in the DOD. At, uh, I worked at that place. So later on tonight, if you want to ask me questions about current events. It used to be Snowden, but that's all kind of old stories now. Now it's uh, WikiLeaks and, and the CIA leaks and the NSA leaks. And everything seems to be leaking. Um, but yeah, we can talk about that later. Um, has anybody ever heard of this book, Dark Territory? Came out about a year, year and a half ago. Right? Nobody? few people. Um, Dark Territory, The Secret History of the Cyber War. In it, there's a chapter called Eligible Receiver. Does anybody know what Eligible Receiver is? Yes? Shout it out. What is Eligible Receiver? Football? It has something to do with football, maybe. Uh, it is a football term. Eligible Receiver was an exercise that NSA did. It was basically the first coordinated pen test of the DOD. It happened back in 1997. So there's a whole chapter about it. In that chapter, there's this paragraph starting off, the NSA had a similar group called the Red Team, yada, 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 stationed in Phoenix, yada, yada, yada. During its most sensitive drills, the Red Team worked out of a chamber called the Pit, which was so secret that few people at NSA knew it existed, and even they couldn't enter without first passing through two combination lock doors. Not one, two. Um, yeah, this thing is annoying. Um, I'm here to tell you today, I actually was a founding member of the pit. It was our office. 
we sat in cubicles and we were the first red team. We didn't call ourselves that back then, we called ourselves hackers, but we were the first red team at NSA. This is the FanX complex. It's uh, just outside of BWI Airport, south of Baltimore. Have you ever been to BWI Airport? Um, there's a series of buildings there. Uh, it's a good rule of thumb if you're in the Maryland area, if there's a building with a barbed wire fence around it, it's probably a DOD facility. And uh, the pit was actually in this building here, Phoenix 3, on that corner of the building on the second or third floor. I, on I honestly forget which. So it was real. It wasn't exactly what the book made it out to be. So you can tell people now that you know somebody from the pit. Um, one of the people that got the pit going, one of the people that helped NSA decide you should do red teaming, you should do pen testing, you should understand hacker culture was this woman named Becky Bass. Anybody ever heard of Becky Bass? Few people. Um, if you haven't heard of her, I encourage you to find out about her, Google her. She is one of the pioneers in this business, especially for women in InfoSec. She passed away uh, last month rather unexpectedly. Um, she was our she was our mom. We we literally called her mom or info mom. Uh, and she was one of the people responsible for the pit getting getting going, and kept 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 tabs on us over the years. Uh, I would see her every once in a while. I saw her back at RSA, uh, you know, earlier this year. And even though we might not have talked until you know for a year or so, she always seemed to know what I was doing. She kept tabs on all of her kids, so I was one of her kids. So. Um, take a picture of that or find the video when, once it's, uh, Adrian's really good about putting it up. It'll probably be up an hour after I'm done talking, but that's a link to an oral history uh, interview that she conducted a few years back. If you're a student of InfoSec, which you should be if you're in this business, I encourage you to find that and, and read it. If you're writing it down, let me know when you got it, and I'll keep it up there a little bit longer. Um, but she was kind of in it from the beginning, and she's been instrumental in a lot of companies and a lot of industries. Uh, she was one of the founders uh, or pioneers of this concept of intrusion detection. So things that we know about and take for granted today, she probably has a thumbprint on. You guys good? All right. My career, I was thinking about this earlier, my career in, in info security and hacking that I actually got paid for started in 1984. It was not at NSA, however. I was still in college, and I got a summer internship at a, at a Navy facility uh, called the Naval Surface Weapons Center. That's kind of like a 50s-style postcard of it, but that's kind of what it looked like. And uh, my job was to work for a physicist that was doing anti-submarine warfare, and he had this filing cabinet full of years and years worth of, worth of research materials, lots of documents, books, reports, white papers, a lot of stuff that he'd checked out of the technical library, because this was a research lab. And he had gotten a hold of some money and was able to buy one of these newfangled desktop PCs. And I'm pretty sure that's the model that he got. That, and so I was hired as a summer intern basically to go through that filing cabinet and try to catalog it. And he had some database uh, software. And I was supposed to build a, a rudimentary database that just kind of cataloged the context of, of what he had in his safe. Um, when he was trying to explain to me anti-submarine warfare, he said, well, the best way to, to learn about it is read this book. It, it had just been published like within the last year, 83, 84. So the first week as a, as a college student, summer intern working for the government, I got to read a book, which I thought was cool. Um, you know, the hunt, the hunt for Red October, people heard of it, read, read it. Um, you know, Tom Clancy is famous for writing these, these fictional novels based on open source. And, and he got in trouble early and often because he, he nailed stuff pretty well in terms of the accuracy of things that were supposed to be classified information. But, you know, he had a, he had a way of weeding through and, and finding the open source information. But that's not the point of my story. Um, my first lesson in security um, came early on in my assignment where I came in to the office one morning and uh, opened up the safe and there was this pink piece of paper inside of it saying, come see us at security. So the long and short of it was that I had, I had left the safe unlocked. 
So I, I uh, got in trouble. I, I violated the rules. And um, you know, if you're if you're into hacking and safe cracking and lock picking, and if you're familiar with combination locks, I learned the hard way. You need to spin the thing several times to get all the tumblers to set. And people who actually do it on purpose, they'd only turn it a little bit so they could be lazy the next morning and come in and just turn it a little bit and open the safe and be on their way. Nobody ever takes shortcuts in the industry, right? Well, they can do that manually, and, th and that's one of the reasons why they would, they would check. But I was young and I was naive, and I thought, well, what's the big deal? I'm working in a building that's surrounded by barbed wire fence. There's a perimeter. Um, there's, there's a front desk you have to get through, you have to pass a security checkpoint. I, was, I had a badge, you know, somebody had to recognize me, let me in. The office that I was in had a lock on it, had a combination lock, so you had to know the combination to get in the office. And they had security that would roam the halls and be looking for intruders and people that weren't where they were supposed to be. So I thought, well, what's the big deal? So I left the safe unlocked. Surely there's lots of layers of security that it doesn't matter that I didn't do this one thing. So hold that thought, we'll come back to that. But that's, that was my first lesson, that was my early introduction into this thing we call security. So does DOD level security work in the real world? The first thing we probably should do is just kind of level set on, uh, on terminology. What are we talking about when we talk DOD level security? Um, in my travels, in my career, in discussions where DOD level security has come up, I think most people in, in what I call the real world, which is the commercial world, the non-government world, I think most people view that level of security as you know, unlimited funding, unlimited access to technology, you can buy one of everything, you can apply everything, everybody's focused on it. So this nth degree of security. And I like using movie references. Does anybody know what movie that is? Very good. You get a, you pass this portion of the class. Um, you guys that are current or former DOD uh, employees might be familiar with some of these terms. I've been out of the government for 20 years, so there's, there's new terms that have emerged. But um, the idea of DOD level security, at least my understanding of it from my background, is there's lots of different aspects to it. There's lots of different elements to it. Based on usually uh, some sort of objective or something bad happened and so something was developed. Um, when communications started to be hard to be intercepted because uh, the adversary, the enemy, whoever that might be, and think nation state, uh, started doing fancy things like maybe frequency hopping. They had to come up with a way of discovering ways to detect the signals at different frequencies. So it's always been this kind of cat and mouse game. And in the government, everything has to have an abbreviation. So you come up with these cool little phrases for things. So OPSEC, operation security, uh, COMSEC, communication security, ELINT, SEC is security, INT is intelligence and so on and so forth. So lots of different elements, lots of different things going on. But what I learned in the DOD uh, where I was first introduced to a risk model was that uh, all these things that you do are one of one or more elements of what can be called a risk equation. And there's lots of variations on the risk equation. You can Google it, and, there, and I believe in simplifying things. So the most basic elements of a risk equation are basically these. Um, coming up with values, coming up with the algorithms and the mathematics. I don't like to get too much into that. But at its most basic level, a risk equation is you've got some sort of vulnerabilities and you've got threats and you try to reduce them or lower them um, by applying some sort of countermeasures. And all the, the, the end result of all that is this thing that we call risk. And the goal is you want your risk to be lower. Whatever the value is, and that's not necessarily something that's defined or finite, but you know, it's, it's sometimes conceptual, but conceptually you want your risk lower and that means you're safer. In the DOD context, think of it like this. Risk in terms of national security, in, in terms of protecting the DOD, is most often associated with human life. 
whether it's the military, whether it's uh, State Department employees, one of the intelligence agencies, you know, people out in the field doing things that protect the national interests, or citizens themselves abroad or on home. Think of it as risk is most commonly associated with human life. Um, the risk parameters, and these are terms that are not new. We see them out in the industry today all the time. I used to work for a vulnerability management vendor. Threat is a big thing in, in a lot of the advertising and marketing for a lot of companies these days. But if you want to have some fun, go around to some companies that talk about vulnerabilities and threat and ask them what the term just means. Say, what do you mean by threat? What is a threat? And see if you get a consistent answer by the same number, you know, by the people in any individual booth yet along. Let, let alone going from vendor to vendor to vendor. Um, the way I learned it is a vulnerability is a weakness. That's pretty vague, it's pretty undefined, it's pretty generic, and it can mean lots of different things. You can have lots of different vulnerabilities. Automated, manual, uh, process-oriented, machine-oriented, application technology-oriented, but a vulnerability at its most basic level is a weakness. A threat, again, the way I was taught in DOD style, is a who. It's somebody that wants to do something bad to you, steal your data, prevent you from doing something, uh, defeat you in, in, a, in a military conflict. It's a who. Very often in our world these days, I think the, what we used to call threat agents, the, the how, the who's, I'm starting to sound like Dr. Seuss, um, the how the who's do what they want to do on the box with a fox is, is what is oftentimes referred to as a threat. I, I, I think of it more as a threat agent or a threat vehicle, a, a ways to an end, a means to an end. But the threat is a who. And then countermeasures, mitigation is anything you do to prevent. Obviously, a lot of what's been done in our industry over the last 20, 25 years is uh, try to reduce vulnerabilities. So that's a countermeasure, that's a mitigation, and there's lots of technology out there to do that. Or threat detection, threat, de threat mitigation, uh, isolating the threats. There's all sorts of marketing and tools out there that are trying to do something associated with threat. But there's also other things beyond that, you know, perimeter protections, firewalls, preventing access, monitoring, detection. Anything you do that's trying to, to counteract the effects of the fact that, and can we all agree that vulnerabilities are here to stay, they're not going to go away? Um, maybe, maybe the goal isn't necessarily to reduce them, but to manage them, or at least acknowledge that they're there and move, move on to something else. Countermeasures and mitigations are the other things that they do. And that's really the essence of what I'm going to get into today, is some of the other things that we can do, maybe beyond focusing the way it seems like we've done for many years on vulnerabilities and driving the number of vulnerabilities down or, or driving down the threats, if that's possible. Most of you guys, if you've been in the business for a while, you're probably familiar with the concept of CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability in terms of data, in terms of data protection and data security. Again, my background is really fundamentally InfoSec, information security or data security. Um, there are variations, there's, there's some new things that have come up because of technology and because of the computer age and, and things that are done on the computer. Um, things like attribution, which we might have been talking about in the media the last couple months, um, non-repudiation. These are sort of variations on a theme because they don't strictly have to do with data itself. It's more the, the, the side effect of the fact that we do all of our communicating on you know, the internet and, and very fast and very fast forms of communication these days. But again, at its most basic level, we're talking about three different things. Can you, somebody steal your data? Can somebody alter your data? Can somebody prevent your data from getting it to who you want, want it to get to, and vice versa? I used to be a cryptologist. Uh, I spent the first part of my career at NSA working for the manual crypto system shop. We dealt with one-time pads. If you're familiar with one-time pads, it is perfect security. It is not cryptographically breakable because you're using a random key, using some sort of algorithm to combine it to your message, your plain text, and you do it one time and one time only, and it's unbreakable. You have to make sure the key can't be stolen, so there's a key management is issue, but in, in, in this form, you print two copies of a paper pad, and one end gets one copy, one end gets the other copy, you use a page, you destroy it. Quite literally, the, the one-time pads, which we used to distribute for the field, 
They were printed very small, could fit in the heel of your shoe. You could imagine why. Um, they were printed on rice paper that was somewhat edible, and occasionally we would use non-toxic ink, but people would eat it. You know, so just think spy movies. Think spy museum, and that's the kind of stuff that we used to do. Um, we've sat, you know, were they cumbersome? Yes. Were they time consuming? Yes. Uh, we've sacrificed all that. We've sacrificed security, in my opinion, in some ways, for speed and convenience, the internet. So it's all been downhill from the one time pad. So going back to the, the conversation that I had with a customer many year, years ago, we don't, you know, we don't need DOD level security. Um, I think what, and I've asked people, and you know, of course some of these are my thoughts, there, there's reasons why sometimes the answer is no. And again, there's this perception that DOD level security is some nth degree of security, which obviously costs a lot of money and is very complicated to implement, and it requires a lot of personnel. And this all has to start sounding like dollars and cents, dollars and cents. Um, Frankly, a lot of the companies that I've done business with over the years, especially in the retail space, until the internet came along, they didn't really deal with security at all. I mean, they had shoplifting and things like that. They call that uh, loss prevention most of the time. But they weren't really concerned with data security and electronic security and internet security, computer security, whatever they wanted to call it. They simply were retail shops and they wanted to make sure people weren't stealing their goods and they wanted to make sure there wasn't fraud being committed. So not a core competency. And, and frankly, a lot of companies, you know, you'll hear a lot of talks and there's this, there's this underlying belief that every company out there has this organizational structure that nat naturally involves security and there's roles and responsibilities and everybody kind of does it the same way. Uh, reality is that very often doesn't exist. Very often it's a small IT shop and because it's IT and computers, security naturally becomes a part of that. So people take on more responsibility, um, they get burned out, so on and so forth, and then you have your keynote address from this morning. Um, so there's lots of different reasons, but um, for all those reasons, I look back, and this is another example of a, this is hopefully sanitized and redacted, but this was an actual uh, network diagram that I collected from a customer many years ago. Nothing complicated there. PCI says, you know, if you want to, if you want to simplify your, your security requirements, your compliance requirements, isolate your PCI, your card data, to a, a card data environment. So that's represented in this diagram by red circles. So clearly, uh, there's network segmentation there and there's not any issues with cross communications over less trusted networks. Um, my point being, we need to do something more most of the time because companies run complex environments and they do complex things. So, um, in the last couple years, um, primarily because of, and it's hard to keep this slide current quite literally, um, there's been so many incidents, there's been so many breaches, and companies that you thought, wow, why would it happen to them? Whether they're private sector, whether they're government, whether they're security companies, it seems like no matter what we do as an industry, breaches keep happening. So my response in my head was, yeah, maybe we really do need DOD level security. So that's why I'm having this talk here today. Um, 20 years ago when I came out into the private sector, we were mostly going around to companies trying to convince them, look, if you're getting on the internet, you gotta start thinking about security. And if you're gonna start thinking about security, there's a right way to do it. There's a DOD way of doing it. That means you have to have a policy, a strategy. You have to have, write things down. You need to have procedures. You need to have standards. It needs to be organized and systematic. Uh, you know, it needs to be intentional. And so we would go around and, and, and try to teach about the need for the right way of doing things if you're going to get into this internet world and be connected and, and things like that. Um, fast forward to the present, I think a lot of companies uh, in hearing all this uh, philosophy about security uh, too often, and I think there's lots of reasons why this happens, and I think uh, you know we're at fault at some level. Uh, I think vendors are at fault for some level. I think the buying population, the customers are at fault for some level. But I think too often, um, 
everybody just goes to the bottom line. What do I need to buy? How many do I need? Where do I put them? And then I'm okay. Uh, you know, in the beginning, it was what, you know, when I was talking to customers about the need for security, they'd say, well, we've got a firewall, so we're good. And, you know, later on, it's like, well, we've got IDS in place, so we're good. You know, and so on and so forth. Fill in the blank. We've got one of those, so we're good. Um, what I want to do here for the rest of the talk, and, and this is not meant to be me saying this is the way it is. I, this is really intended to be a conversation starter. I, I'm happy if you go away thinking, well, maybe there is more to think about in terms of DOD level security. Maybe there is more to, maybe we shouldn't dismiss it and just you know, keep moving to the solutions. Maybe we do need to consider some of the things that I'm going to present here today. So my goal is to make you think. Uh, if, if you don't think that's fine, but, uh, and if you don't agree with me, that's fine too. But at the core, DOD level security is all about data. It's, it's, I'm an infosec professional, information security professional. That's, that's what I call myself because that's what I was when I started out. You guys remember this movie? Sneakers. Um, you know, this came out in 92, so I was still at NSA back in those days, and, you know, so this wasn't a new concept um, in this scene, and I have access to the notes, the bad guy, Ben Kingsley, and is he really a bad guy? He says to Marty, the good guy, Robert Redford, there's a war out there, old friend, a world war, and it's not about who's got the most bullets. It's about who controls the information, what we see and hear, how we work, what we think, it's all about the information. Of course, that doesn't apply today, right? We've blown right past that. So it's all about the information. The risk equation, which I still try to teach to customers at some level, which I still try to explain to people within our community, especially the, the vendor booths that I go to and try to trip people up because they don't know the meanings of the words. Um, to be honest and be frank and to be realistic, and, I'm not, and I think this might be the, the big kingpin that, that really makes this complicated is there's a new variable when, when you think about the, applying the risk equation in the commercial world, and that is some sense of the value of data. Um, and underlying all that is the risk when you come up with this figure which is designed to be as low as possible. In the commercial world, this is dollars and cents. This is money. And there's money involved in vulnerability management, there's money involved in threat management, there's money involved in the countermeasures, either the cost of doing it or not doing it, the cost of the technologies, the cost of the training and the personnel. It's all about money. But I found with my customers too often over the years that they didn't have any concept of the data that they were trying to protect. There was some high level of understanding, especially in the PCI world where we have to protect the credit card information, but then ask them where it was in their network and usually you got a blank stare. Um, in the DOD, uh, there was some level of value of data and different types of data has different values. And I'm sure, you, you know, if you're in the military, DOD, you're, you're familiar with this. Um, the idea of data classification, which is not hopefully a new concept in, in the real world, in the commercial world. But what I've seen over the years in the real world is too often it's binary. There's company proprietary information, confidential information, or there's unclassified or for official use or whatever they want to call it. It's usually binary. We need, we, we need to protect it or we don't need to protect it. Um, yeah, I've been to pharmaceutical research companies where they've got research drug, you know, information on drugs. They want to protect that. They have to protect that for so long. Even I did a, I won't say the name of the company, I did a paint company one time where the, the formulas, the recipes for their paint is something they value very highly. You know, it dries quicker. It doesn't smear when you clean it. It's, it withstands the weather and the sun. That's all very valuable to them. And they have patent protection, but only for a certain amount of time. They have some concept of, of, of value of data in terms of time. But too often, especially in the retail world, and in, in many aspects, financial, insurance, banking, you've got this idea of financial accounting information, customer information, protected forever. Everything is done binary. We either protect it forever or we don't. In the DOD, however, 
there was this concept of some data is more valuable than other data. And usually that meant it needed to be protected for a longer or a less longer period of time or a less long period of time. Um, the best example I can give you, um, if you've seen war movies where, you know, it's Vietnam, it's Korea, it's, it's Afghanistan, and you've got a team that's out in the field and, and they've run into the enemy and they're getting, you know, shot to pieces, so they want to call in an airstrike. They want somebody to call in and, you know, bomb or strafe the enemy position. Um, so they're calling in coordinates. These days they do it with GPS. It's a little bit more accurate and it's drones and guided missiles. But, you know, think back Vietnam era, World War II, Korean War. They were calling in latitude and longitude. And it was pretty daggone important to get that, that information correct. So confidentiality, keeping it protected, the integrity of it, making sure it wasn't the bad guys saying, hey, this is Joe, and they, they're not speaking with an Asian accent or a you know, German accent, and calling in the grid coordinates and fooling the bomb, bomb crews. So very important to protect that information, but really only for maybe an hour, half hour, until whatever happened, happened, and they either hit the right target or they didn't. But afterwards, it didn't really matter if the bad guys knew what the coordinates were, because the damage had been done or hadn't been done. Now, that's sort of the low end. Very valuable, very sensitive information doesn't need to be protected very long. The opposite end of that is information that you're getting from uh, compromised or, or turned resources, what we call spies, um, that are deeply embedded in the organization and government of our nation state adversary. And you can imagine who it was when I was there in the 80s and 90s. Um, information that perhaps only in theory two or three people in the world knew that information because it was a conversation with just a small set of people in a room in some building in some city in some country and for for our government to have that information the sensitivity of that information it wasn't so much what was said and what was decided while that was important what was more important was what we called the methods and the sources, how that information was obtained and or by who that information was obtained. Um, that type of information, it's important to keep a uh, secret oftentimes forever because if you don't, you either lose the source, which is often a person who often becomes deceased or it's a method, like you had a bug planted somewhere, or some, some way of capturing the information that the bad guys, the adversaries figure out there must be something here and they find it, destroy it, so you lose that source of information. In World War II, we, you know, we, we know about this, we see them in the museums, there's been movies about it, you know, the Germans had the Enigma machine. Everybody seen the Enigma machine or know something about it? Um, the fact that we had that broken, the fact that we were able, we, the Allies, the Brits and the U.S., were able to read information, the, the messages off of that, that was a closely guarded secret. In fact, when I started working at NSA in the mid-80s, it was still a secret that we knew how to break the enigma. Anybody want to take a guess as to why that was still a secret? Still countries using it. There were still countries using it. Low-level diplomatic communications, perhaps, less important, you know, Soviet bloc countries. But it was still being used, so it was still a secret. But imagine, you know, we were learning, we learn about it now in the movies and the museums, that, that the Enigma machine was broken back in the early 40s. So for 45, almost 50 years, the fact that that machine was broken and we were able to read the messages, that was kept a secret. That's a success story. That was sensitive information that was protected some way, some shape, or form for a very long time. We don't do that in this industry very often. Uh, you know, there's exceptions to everything, but I don't see very often an understanding of a difference in the value or the difference in the life expectancy of data, which I submit to you is what we're talking about primarily in terms of security in our world. This is not a new concept either. We call it security in depth, or we call it segmentation. But you know, this is actually a, an aerial view of a, a city in Italy that was built in the 1500s. You know, whether it was a king or a, a, a feudal lord, you know, the lord of the manor, you can imagine where he was located physically in times of conflict. 
you know, we intuitively understand that the further in you go, the safer it is, the more protected you are. And we sort of do this in the networking world because we talk about segmentation and separation and, and, very, and those are valid things that we do. But one concept in the DOD that I don't hear mentioned very often in, in the real world is the idea of not only are you trying to make it more complicated and take more time for a bad guy to get to the crown jewels or what's really they're after, which presumably is behind layers and layers of protection, you also want to make it more costly than it's worth for them to do it. So. Uh, all of these steps might not be impenetrable in and of themselves, but it takes time, it takes effort, it takes some sort of resource and expense. In the DOD world I came from, we used to de design systems and design the layer of systems and we used to try to evaluate how long and how m much time and, and most importantly how much money would it take an adversary to go through all these hoops and jumps. And our goal was to make it more expensive than they were willing to spend the money based on the value of the data that they were after. How does this apply in the commercial world? I don't know, but if we understood the value of data, perhaps we'd have a better understanding of this risk equation, especially since so much of it ha has to do with dollars and cents. If nothing else, maybe we could make more informed decisions, better informed decisions about where and how much mo money to invest in the protections based on the value of the data. Um, so you remember the story I told you at the beginning about my early experience of security um, breaking a rule, uh, which I thought was kind of silly at the time because there was layers of protections, there was a lot of different safeguards in place, and one single failure I thought, what's the big deal? But what I've learned over the years, and, and the lesson that I sort of took away from this early experience, is that and looking back on it, it really was reflective of what I call a culture of security. That, that organization that I worked for back when I was still in college, while there was a perimeter fence uh, that protected the building, everybody understood that that layer of protection provided some level of protection, but it wasn't ultimate level of protection. There were ways around it, and to some degree there was processes and additional things put in place, especially over the years. Maybe there's motion detectors built into the fences. Maybe there's cameras on the fences. Maybe there's physical patrols that patrol the fences, you know, looking for the, the, the hole that's been dug under the fence, or the hole that's been cut into the fence, or the ladder that's been propped over the fence. So it wasn't a single protection without process and procedures built around that, that protection. Same with the, you know, getting in through the, through the front door, getting past the initial front gate. We didn't have those turnstiles in the 80s. We didn't have RFID in the 80s. But, you know, there's all these layers and processes. Um, many organizations that I worked for, the security guards were rotated on a regular basis, not to relieve boredom, but they didn't want the security guards to get to know people in terms of facial recognition. So they wouldn't say, oh, Jeff, you've been coming in here every day for the last three months. Of course, come in today, not knowing that I'd been fired the day before and been walked off. So they would rotate people so there wasn't familiarity. It was a process, it was a procedure, it was a step, but it was intended as part of this culture of security. There was even at some point where um, the badges, you know, it was supposed to be a picture badge and, and the, the guard's supposed to look at it and say, yeah, that's you. Um, you know, a lot of times you, you just wave it and, and, you know, sometimes we would wave a credit card and get by you know, and do the stuff like that. So there was a time where the, the security guard had to physically touch. There was a, a rule that came out. They had to physically touch the badge. So then the security guards came up with these wands, you know, like they ripped the antennas off of radios and so they could extend it and, okay, I've touched your badge because, I don't know, they didn't want to, they didn't want to touch this or they were fundamentally lazy, whatever the rule was. But, Again, there was processes, there were steps, there was layers, but under, uh, underneath all that was most of the people at the organization, they kind of understood the rules and they obeyed them because they knew it was all part of a, a bigger plan. Um, you know, same with locks on the doors, changing the combination to the door, uh, having layers of security. You know, the pit had two doors. Uh, didn't really, but you can believe it. Some places did. Um, layers, steps, processes and everybody understood. 
and the security guards roaming, uh, roaming different halls at different times, not, not having predictable behaviors. All this stuff, all these procedures and processes, and we haven't even gotten to the computers and the technology yet. But again, as I look back on it, everybody that worked there kind of understood the mission, understood the national security interest, understood that there was lives at stake, and sort of bought into, I'm going to do my part, so I'm going to follow the rules. If I've got a stupid young college intern uh, summer help that breaks a rule, I'm going to light into him, and boy did the guy light into me, uh, for doing some silly little thing like leaving a safe unlocked and exposing documents that had been sitting in that thing for 20 years. Um, there was a culture, there was a belief in an overall mission uh, of, of security, which again is something that, did, that, the, that the DOD has that perhaps we don't have in the private sector. And, and, and that's probably okay to some extent, but is there a lesson that can be applied? Is there an idea that, yeah, we're a, a department store and we sell clothing, but understanding that we're engaging in a, in a connected world and we're taking advantage of t technologies, is there a level of understanding that we need to have and a raising of the mission that properly applies security to what it is that we do to our business? Um, that's something I've tried to do with my customers over the years. Um, with limited success, unfortunately. But even just teaching the fact that security, uh, if you believe the vendor community, if you believe our industry very often, if you just do this, you're done. Or you need to, you know, obviously update the technology. And, and these days, you have to have a lot of different technology in place and, and keep it current and keep it patched and keep updating. But um, there's still this underlying belief that you kind of set it and forget it. You know, people don't want to have to buy into the fact that security is something you do, that it's a lifestyle. So uh, I learned in the DOD that security is really a verb. It's really something you do. It's not a place or a state that you get to and you're done and you're safe. It's ongoing. It's learning. It's iterative. It's evolutionary. So this is actually a slide that I used to use 20 years ago just to describe, okay, if you're going to get on the internet and you're going to start thinking about security, you need to understand that it's a process. Um, I apologize that it's hard to read. Now, that it's evolved. You know, the, I had five steps 20 years ago. We still have, in some instances, five steps today. I think this is based on the cybersecurity framework. Um, the names have changed a little bit, but there's still this concept of there's this iterative, evolutionary, constant thing that you do. Um, if you read this, uh, and if you have a bias like I do, you'll, you, you'll see that this is sort of oriented towards technology in and of itself which I submit to you is perhaps short-sighted. Um, data is one asset class now where I still think and believe in most cases data is what it's all about. This is, it's foundational. It's not just one of many other things. But most people these days think assets are the computers, the technology, the servers, the mobile devices, the laptops, all the different stuff that you have in place that if you think about it, it's all passing data, which is why I believe that data is fundamental. Um, I think a lot of what's missing in terms of implementing an understanding of a security life cycle are some of these things here that, that uh, uh, and you'd be surprised even for companies that I, ha I was working with that were doing credit card security. Again, they, they would maybe understand they were trying to protect credit card data, but then ask them where it was. And they were surprised when we would start finding it in dozens of different places that they had no idea how many people and the reach and the breadth of where all this data, because it was sales data, it was transaction data, we call it big data these days. It was data that they could use to help with their loyalty programs, decide what coupons to spit out so somebody could buy another brand of diapers or whatever it was. Um, but overall, there was just not this understanding of what are we trying to accomplish? What is the point? What is the purpose? Other than we got to check a box, we got to pass some sort of compliance thing. Um, unfortunately, I think this is very, this is all very often too common that this stuff is not understood and not applied. So, some random parting thoughts. Well, maybe not so random, but trying to tie all this together a little bit. Um, 
I've talked about a little bit this in terms of the blame, why things are the way they are. Uh, I blame vendors often, even though I used to work for one briefly. Uh, I did learn in my time in vendor land that vendors aren't always just lying to you. A lot of times they just don't know. They're, they're making it up as they go along or they're picking up the buzzwords that they think are meaningful or they're trying to appeal to your pain point. You know, they're all the tricks and techniques. But fundamentally, they're feeding into this, what do I need to buy? And most companies don't want to buy services. Most companies don't want to buy advisory work that people teaching them how to do stuff. Because what do you have to show at the end of the day? Um, it's much easier to have that blinky light box in the corner and all the lights are green saying we're good. Or we have the dashboard or the report. And have you ever noticed that all the dashboards these days for all the products look identical? Yeah. Why is that? I don't know. Does it work or is it? Ah. Aha. So to me, there's too much focus on technology and not a focus on the underlying what it is, what are we all about, which is more often than not data protection. Um, I think, to be frank, and this is not meant to be a knock on the company that I used to work for, but I, I think this whole industry uh, emphasizes vulnerabilities too much. And again, I'd like to, and this is just an idea, but maybe we focus too much on vulnerabilities. Maybe we move on to another element of the risk equation and focus the whole industry on something else for a while. We're doing that a little bit with threat. But maybe just maybe we should move on to countermeasures. And maybe, maybe we should move on to understanding the dollars and cents and trying to really define risk for what risk is. Is it on a previous slide or did I on a future slide? But I hear so many people talking about risk and threat is synonymous. They, they use those words interchangeably. But risk is the equation. It's the, it's the result that we're trying to get. Threat is one of the variables. So they're different somehow. One is a subset of the other. We don't talk about that too much. Penetration testing, because penetration testing too often is discovering vulnerabilities. I think penetration testing, having used to done, do, having done penetration testing, I think we should have evolved by now. It was great in the very beginning to discover what was wrong. But for companies that purportedly have some sort of semblance of a security program, perhaps the penetration testing should be doing threat emulation. Perhaps it should be the fire drill. Perhaps it should be testing your response capabilities. Because if you think of a lot of the breaches, you know, the slide that I showed earlier, m the vast majority of those companies, they didn't discover that they had a problem. Somebody walked in and said, hey, you've got a problem. You know, whether it was law enforcement, the FBI, the card brands saying, hey, we've traced all the fraud back and guess what, it's you. Uh, so anyway, just some random thoughts. But um, anybody know what this is? The Rainbow Series. All started with that orange book up there in the corner. Where's my? Oh, it, it bounces off that screen. Top left corner of the orange book. I think that was published, somebody help me out, like 1983, something like that. It's been around a while. And uh, when I first read it, and, and back when I started looking at the Rainbow Series, I think there was maybe 10. I don't even know how many are up there now. Quite literally, the second book in the series, you know, the, the orange book was maybe half an inch thick. The next one was maybe three quarters of an inch thick. And the second one, I don't remember the exact title, but it was basically how to read and understand the orange book. So it kind of morphed from there. And if you think that's bad, and if you think that's overcomplicated and over analysis, um, this is something I saw online a couple of months ago, the CISO mind map. And you know, if you get a hold of, you can Google this and find this, Google CISO mind map. Um, you can get a high resolution thing. So there's lots of small print under what, you, what could be described as domains. This is supposed to be all the different things that a CISO has to be responsible for and be an expert on. And, and there might be an exception in there once or twice, but most of the small print items I think are tied specifically to a product. So it's all about technology. It's all about being focused on what products do what for you. Um, this is just an alternative example, again, something I saw online. Somebody tried to map out all the different areas of expertise, all the domains that are related to the job of the CISO or the job of the security department. Um, that's, that's, I don't pretend to know everything about all those domains up there. I know a little about a lot of them, but that's a lot to swallow. And again, it's mostly technology-based. Everybody's familiar with this? Uh, mantra, people, process, and technology. Um, I submit to you that 
there's a fourth element that you start with, which is purpose. In the DOD, our purpose was to save lives, to protect our national interests. When you're a company or an organization, you're going to have a different purpose. And security was really the business that the DOD was in. Um, and that's not the business of an insurance company or a convenience store or a gas station. But security does play a role. So understand your purpose, understand your context, understand security, how it fits into what it is you're trying to accomplish as a business. That's when you start then applying people, processes, and technology. Hopefully, having a more informed understanding of what you should be doing and maybe hopefully I have a bias from having been a consultant a little bit more on the people and processes and maybe not so much on the technology or at least before you invest in the technology you've gone through the necessary other steps um, so remember it's all about the information we know that because we learned that in 1992 uh, Robert Redford and, and Ben Kingsley were right uh, I like to say technology isn't the solution it's the problem you can quote me um, security is not a state to achieve uh, I'm more and more convinced that uh, and I'm a curmudgeon and I think one of the definitions of curmudgeons is you have more questions than you have answers. So I acknowledge I have more questions than answers. But I do believe that if more people have knowledge and awareness of how they fit into the organization, what their role is uh, in terms of the business process and how security applies to it, maybe, just maybe, we'll start getting beyond the, the clicking and the phishing and all that kind of stuff. Not perfectly, but again, I think back to the first organization I worked for. Everybody understood their role. Everybody understood why it was important to follow the rules. And, you know, the young kid from college that uh, maybe it was my hacker mentality thought, ah, oh, rules aren't important. I can just do what I want and find the way to the end. You know, there's, there's some sort of balance there. And we can go back and check the tape. I don't think I said that word at once in this whole talk, did I? That one at the bottom? And I will not use that word. <laughs> um, just very briefly, uh, I'm here uh, uh, graciously because of a company called Cyberary. Cyberary is Cyber Library. It's an online, open source, free learning uh, resource. You can sign up for free. If you're working for a company that has uh, products that you have training courses, demos, use cases, their goal is to suck everything up and make everything freely available. It's something about that knowledge sharing. Um, Cyberary.it, you can check it out. Um, they're committed to keeping it free. They are almost to a million subscribers. I think they're projected to hit that in the next uh, couple weeks because they get thousands of subscribers on a daily basis. Um, it really is free. They've got thousands of hours of video courses on there. Um, there's lots of information to learn. And um, they're relatively new. They're Maryland-based. I'm from Maryland. Did I mention it's free? and uh, check it out at cyberay.it and soon uh, I just finished up doing a video course and you'll get to see your, yours truly uh, online there as well. Questions, comments? I'm full of it. Retire already because we're beyond this thing. Anybody? The floor is open. You're comatose. Somebody's got something. I've seen risk equations that include lots of uh huh. Uh, does that, how does that match your equation? Yeah, that. Yeah, again, I tried to you know simplify, perhaps overly simplify. We used to the the first time I learned the risk equation, there was two elements of likelihood. One was the likelihood that if an attack was attempted, it would be successful, and there was another one that mapped out the likelihood that somebody would attempt to go after this in the first place. So I forget what we called that technically, but you know there there is a lot of. Uh, elements and sub-variables, subplots to the whole risk equation. Um, PCI, for example, is binary. You're either doing it or not, and they, and they purport to be risk-based, but risk-based in that context means the security professional should advise you on what's the best thing to do, and in that context, it's the, the QSA, the Qualified Security Assessor, which is the role that I had. Um, but I came to find out when I got out of PCI that I was talking to maybe roughly 
1% of the companies that had to do PCI. So there's 99% of companies out there that don't have the expert to go to that can make that risk-based decision. And basically, risk-based means it's your derriere, derriere if something bad happens. So what are they left with? They're left with the vendors that are selling them, saying, hey, if you sign up with us, all your burden of compliance goes away. We've got, we've got you covered until something bad happens and you read the small print and you find out you've still got the liability. Um, so it, it's an important factor of the risk equation. Um, and again, go out and Google. There's a million variations of the risk equation. There's Actually, I like this one a little better, but the likelihood ends up being a stumbling block. We don't have the actual aerial data that actually shows this is as likely as a tension level event or a meteor hitting your house or whatever. Right. And really getting away from that. Assuming that, okay, just for the sake of discussion, just the humor, let's move the discussion along. Let's assume that it's one. Let's break it down and right. consider what the mitigations are. That's actually, I think, maybe even more useful. Right, uh, or assign it just a few values, you know, 100% likelihood, 50%, 25%, I zero. Like down, the likelihood is going to try and it will be successful. That's, that's good thorough thinking, but if you're, your audience is hung out as well, this has never happened before, nothing ever happens here. Right. So this is, you're, you're trying to sell me something that I'll never get around to get you know, to seeing, the, actually thinking about the, well, what, what if it did? What if it, okay, you, you sell hammers, you sell shoes, but mm. you're also trafficking this valuable customer data that you're right. counting on keeping. Right. Or you're treating it responsibly. What would happen, just say, just for the sake of discussion, what would happen if that didn't, if that ended up someplace that it did, wasn't supposed to be? Right. And, and that came a lot. That came up in conversation a lot with my customers over the years, and usually what they what they asked was, "What is my competitor doing?" Because I'll, I'll do as as much, but not more than what they're doing, because then I will be considered to be doing best practice, or and and hopefully I won't get in trouble when I do get popped. Because there's been a lot of forgiveness in the industry, you know. Uh, I think there's a certain belief that well, it could happen to anybody, which it could, and it will happen to anybody, and it's just a matter of time. And you know, there before the grace of God, you know, goes I. It wasn't Lowe's this time; it was Home Depot, and so on and so forth. But uh, you know, in our business too. Uh, you know, the likelihood that somebody can be successful given certain, uh, you know, starting points, which we know there's an endless, I mean, we know everything's broken and you can get into it, right? Uh, so the likelihood is high. Then you get into the likelihood that somebody would try it. And it used to be that the belief was, well, um, you know, a, a bad guy is, is taking a certain amount of risk attempting to break in, and the belief was you have to establish a beachhead, get in, find the repository of the gazillion records of data, and then be able to figure out how to get it out. In PCI land in particular, the paradigms change. Now they're installing malware, and they're harvesting, and they're harvesting over time. And they're hitting the small stores that have been largely ignored because there wasn't the volumes. And so the belief was we got to protect the large repositories and the little ones will just kind of, you know, eh, nobody's going to bother because they don't want to risk being caught for just such a small payoff. But that's changed. So the risk and the likelihood has changed. Yes? So I was at another conference a few weeks ago and the keynote speaker, I his exact name right, he was one of the assistant attorney generals for the United States. So he worked for the United States. Okay. And so, of course, you want to answer my question to Yahoo because they never comment on direct things. But my question involved, because of that example, they were treating Yahoo as the victim of the breach that led to, rather than a party who was grossly negligent. And especially, <laughs> and so, the, the reading between the lines answer is, it is the policy of the U.S. Department of Justice to never treat the victim in that case of a hacking as being having led to it as a matter of policy. So I don't see how do we make this better if, if ultimately there is no consequence. Here's a harsh, sober, and adult analogy that I have for that. Um, because Yahoo was a victim. I mean, they are a victim of a crime. Were they grossly negligent and contributory? Yes. But the best analogy to, to begin this conversation that I've discovered, by the way, I love Rogue. That's my favorite beer. Um, is is uh, sex crimes against women. You know, she shouldn't have been in that neighborhood. Why was she wearing that? She had it coming. Or recently we could talk about, uh, you know, other types of crimes against other minorities and things like that. But there, you know, what was her personal history? 
you know, think of all the Bill Cosby cases, you know, O'Reilly most recently, and, and all the things that are being piled up on the accusers and everything that's being said about the victim. So it's not a perfect analogy, but there is some element at the end of the day, companies, no matter how grossly negligent they were, they are victims of a crime because a bad guy has committed a crime against them and, and done something. Could they have done more to prevent it? We can certainly have a conversation about that. But I don't want to lose the element of there is a crime involved here. Does that make sense? And we can agree to disagree and fight over it later? I or discuss it more? <laughs> but the, the challenge, it, the difference, even though it's not perfect, is someone like Yahoo actually creating an insecure login system actively ignoring their security team, calling them the paranoids, and then ultimately the, the head of that team leaves mm -hmm. and their pastures where his work is appreciated. That is not a good pattern to say that that's business as usual. But they did get punished in the market. But yeah, and selling that the insurance company is not covering mm -hmm. data breaches due to the negligence would sort of help to fix that? Not even. Yeah, unfortunately, we get into the, the world of, you know, it, it's come up mostly now in IoT. And what's the solution for the insecurity of IoT? It's going to be regulatory, and it's going to be fines, and, and something coming from the government. With most, most of the time, our community says, we don't want the government involved because they're morons. And interestingly enough, as a parting thought, I don't really truly believe that the DOD practices DOD level security anymore, because all the people that knew DOD security in the old days have retired, have moved on, came out into the private sector. There's, there's been a lot of institutional knowledge, so there's been this, now the DOD looks outside and tries to apply this stuff that we've been doing in the commercial world, for better or for worse. That's enough. Uh, we're out of time. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your conference.